<laughs> Do you want to introduce yourself? So I'm Jamie. I'm Mo. One of you just friends. Also a third year medic. I'm a third year medical student here at Sydney. I'm about to relive my interview, which I'm not very excited for. <laughs> I'm the best one here by far. God. Cool. Take me back. <laughs> yeah. Right. The way this is going to work is I'm going to ask you some questions. You're going to sort of answer as if you were taking this mock interview. If you're stuck on the questions, I'll give you a bit of hint as to where I want you to take the line of thinking. There are some figures that you will need to use for some of the questions. Okay. Um, I'll give you my iPad in a bit for that. Um, let's let's start. Okay. First question. Why do humans have two eyes instead of one? So that's uh, an interesting question. Um... <laughs> A larger visual field mm -hmm. you also have higher resolution so like you can see the fine details in images more <laughs> depth perception also can you expand on that how does that work so if an object is very far away your eyes are going to be focusing inwards if it's like straight ahead of you and the closer it is towards you the more your eyes turn inwards to be able to see your, your brain uses them, those signals, to determine how far or close an object is. Judgment of relative depth is one of the key benefits of having two eyes, because if you only had one eye, then depth, the, the depth perception is obviously going to be very hard. Um, you can't have kind of angled <laughs> vision at an object. Okay, yeah, I'll take, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> Why do humans have forward-facing eyes, but cows have sideward-facing eyes? So is this just mammals? Mm -hmm. Okay. If I think just about mammals, all of the all of the mammals with front facing eyes are more predatory, as all of the ones with side facing eyes are more prey. So I'm guessing it's because cows are prey and we're predators, so cows have to be more on the lookout with a wide wide angle view, whereas we need to be able to kind of spot prey and fruit or whatever cavemen used to eat. If you have them pointing to the side, you have a much larger visual field than if you have them pointing f forward. So then you can sense danger more presumably. If a cow's eyes don't point in the same direction, how might they judge the distance to objects? Um, interesting. I haven't thought about that before. silence out okay so if you were given like a 2d photograph like the image this is like the equivalent of having an image from a single eye how would you go about determining the distance of the objects in that image well i guess it would be a mix of things like perspective shadows light you can use the other senses as well so like smell hearing differences in time between sounds reaching one ear and the other these sorry these time intervals are very short and therefore would probably only help with shorter objects at shorter different <laughs> objects at a shorter distance sorry in terms of how far away it is you're going to be relying on the intensity of the smell and the intensity of the sound produced by whatever it is you're listening to then you've also got smell smell probably wouldn't be too great why not because you can't really distinguish between anything yeah does it? Yeah. No way. Yeah. No. Yeah, the old... You can't tell like a chicken is five meters away. We can't, but other animals can. I mean, you'd you'd have to know the smell and also, say you had one object, smelly object close, <laughs> and smelly object far, you'd have to kind of know the strength of the smell as well as what they actually smell like in order to work out. You know, I can smell this. This strongly and this that strongly. Those were the intro questions. <laughs> <laughs> this was so hard. So now for the main questions, and then if you get onto it, we'll go to the extension questions. <laughs> if I get onto it. So for the main question, you're going to need diagrams. So I've prepared these diagrams here on my iPad. So Figure One shows a simplified version of the human visual pathway as viewed from above. The blue and green lines represent nerves which travel from the retina at the back of the eyeball to the visual cortex where information is processed. The triangles at the top of the image represent light entering the patient's eyes. Figure 2 represents the visual field of a healthy patient, with each circle representing the input from one eye. Using one of the blank visual fields in Figure 2, 
shade in the area of the visual field, which would be lost if nerves at point one were cut. Okay, so one is your right optic nerve. That's cutting both of the nerves from the right eye. So it's transmitting all information from your right eye. So if that is lesion, that's gonna lose all the information in green, which is just vision in the right eye. So let's just fill that in. Now draw what would happen if the nerves at point three were cut. So point three is the dark green. It's after the optic chiasm. And the dark green, which is here. So what I'm just gonna do is Hang on, my pen's too thick. So in, in both cases, you lose the left side of your vision in both eyes. So, your left neurons... <laughs> <laughs> so in an actual interview, you should talk more than I am. So it's going to be... So I believe that this is what you get. You would lose left temporal vision and right nasal vision as per part. So how would each of these injuries affect a patient's day-to-day -day life? What would be different in each scenario? What tasks might they find more difficult or more dangerous? So for one, you're going to lose vision completely out of one eye. Um, as we were talking about earlier, just having one eye is bad for depth perception. Um, and the immediate things that come to mind are driving, um, Sports. So sports like tennis or badminton where something is coming at you and you have to be able to hit the ball or thing accurately. <laughs> nice! <laughs> Cambridge Med. In terms of jobs, they would not be able to do anything like driving. They would probably still be able to cope with kind of work on a screen, on a desk job kind of thing. When would these be dangerous? Probably if you're driving. Uh, crossing a road, you know, if you're... Crossing a road, you have to look left. Um, you might not see a car coming, you might die. Not much else I can say to that. <laughs> the pituitary gland lies directly below the optic chiasm. So this is location two in figure one. Okay. Uh, what might happen to the visual field if a patient had a large tumor in their pituitary gland? As you said, the pituitary gland lies inferiorly to the optic chiasm. So any pituitary adenoma or adenocarcinoma, didn't mean that's a thing, pituitary adenoma, it's going to get big and it's going to compress the nerves at number two. Or in all directions, but most significantly on the optic chiasm. Which would effectively be the same as cutting them. So in number two, you lose the dark blue, the dark blue nerve, which is your left visual field from your left eye. And you also lose light green, which is your right visual field out of your right eye. So you'd get something called bilateral hemianopia, which looks like this. So what might a patient complain of? They might complain that they've got tunnel vision. They might also complain about double vision or reduced night vision because less light is entering uh, certain points of their eye. Well, like. Same amount of light is entering the eye, but like less you of the process. Yeah. yeah. That's the main questions done. You've done the intro, yeah. the main questions. Okay, for the next part of the interview, we'd like to test your reading abilities. Read it out loud. You have to read it out loud. I'm actually doing this. I want emotion. <laughs> Circle Tutors is a company that produces and sells packs of Oxbridge interview questions so that students can have realistic, high quality mock interviews. These questions are written by Oxbridge students and include explanations on how to approach each question in detail. They currently offer free sample packs like no money, zero pennies. It's like the one being used in this video for medicine, engineering and physics with an option to purchase more questions if you would like. You can use discount code UJAL10, reminded to spell that U double J A L 10. Just look at his YouTube name, subscribe as well, for 10% off of your purchase. Their website also offers free tips and advice for Oxbridge applications, which are definitely worth the read. Maybe not. You have to find out. Man, I really love Ujal. Shame his YouTube channel is so shit. I. Whoa, 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 whoa. Cut, 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 cut. <laughs> well, we're moving on to the extension questions now. Look at figure three. 
This diagram shows where rod and cone photoreceptor cells are found within the retina. Cone cells provide color vision, but rod cells only provide grayscale vision. Can you interpret the graph for me? Describe the distribution of different photoreceptors within the retina. What is this graph? <laughs> Okay, so first of all, it's quite obvious that there are far more rods than cones, and these are mainly or primarily located just outside of the, the center of the eye. Um, so they peak at, it looks like, about 20 degrees um, around the fovea. And the blue line means the cones. So I'm going to start off with the cones. So you get the highest amount of cones as expressed per number of, re number of receptors per millimeter squared at zero degrees from the center, so the cones. There's gonna be a lot of cones in the middle of the eye as compared to like the outside range. And there's a part here, B, where there's zero cones and zero rods. Do not, oh, that's gonna be your blind spot. Where the optic disc is, so you have neither rods or cones in that location. Um, and that's, as I said in the previous question, due to the retinal ganglion cells leaving the retina, piercing through the photoreceptor layer um, to form the optic layer. Why are the cone cells only concentrated around point A? Cones, they're responsible for colour vision. The cones are mainly in the fovea, um, which is kind of the central part of the eyeball, which has the most acute vision. And the reason they're in the middle of the eye is because that's where we focus on higher image resolution like you can see fine detail you can see the color of the object contours and stuff like that uh, but in the like in the outside of your visual field you don't really need to see the detail in an object as much as you need to see its presence or its movement and that's what the rods are for what do you notice about your color vision in the dark and why might this occur color definitely gets less clear in the dark uh, things tend to become more black and white and I would take it that this occurs because rods are more sensitive to um, dark. <laughs> <laughs> so in the dark, there's less photons. That means that we have less of a comparative value. Would it be beneficial if rods and cones both operated at the same light levels? So if that was the case, then it's possible that the rod responses would kind of, because there are way more of them, would they kind of overpower the cone responses so that you lose some kind of color vision? That's an interesting idea. If I was a Cambridge professor and I was like interviewing you, maybe we'd expand into this, but I have no idea. What I'd say would be like, it would just be re rather redundant if you had two sort of things operating at the same light levels, wouldn't it? It'd just be like too much expenditure. Well, that's why you got in, no, I didn't. <laughs> I'm an imposter. Looking at the diagram, does your observation explain why it's harder to read a book or focus on fine detail in the dark? Or are there other factors involved? It does. At first I was slightly confused because rods are better in the dark and there are lots of them. But then I realised that in the fovea, which is what you use to, you know, actually look at stuff, it's the focus point of your visual field. Um, you pretty much only have cones and not really any rods. Um, and at darker light intensities, the cones will be inactive or far less active, um, and therefore it's harder to distinguish between, you know, letters of your book at low background light intensities. Okay, I think I think that's it. Thank God. That's what would have gotten me into Cambridge. <laughs> How did you find it? <sighs> hard. <laughs> Embarrassingly hard. It was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> was it harder than your actual interview? Thinking back to my year 13 self, probably. Do you think you'd get in? Doubt it. Oh, actually, I mean, I probably wouldn't from that, but it, a little tip is that you can never tell how well your interview has gone. Some people think it went amazingly and no get in. Some people think it went really badly and then do get in. So don't worry too much about how your interview went until you get your results back. So do you have any like tips or advice you'd like to give? As you can see, first and foremost, be comfortable. You don't need to wear a suit or nothing. Like if you're comfortable wearing a suit, just do that. Otherwise, just be you. Uh, always talk. I didn't do it very well, but you should never really be silent. Even if you don't know what the answer is, they're, they're not expecting you to know every answer straight away. And instead of sitting there thinking in silence, you just want to be talking through your thought process, processes and they want to see how your mind is working and things. If you're genuinely stuck, just ask for a hint. Because the whole point of an interview 
isn't to see what you know because they're testing you on what you don't know don't be afraid to ask for a hint or a bit of clarification oh clarification is important in one of my interviews i interviewed at queens and i had two separate interviews and in one of them they were asking me about immune system sensitization and i forgot to clarify what sensitization actually sensitization actually was so I ended up speaking about it like it was desensitized desensitization so i kept doing the answers the wrong way around basically they want to see if their style of teaching suits you as a person as an individual so if you're taking hints and you're taking them on board and then you go and answer the question correctly that shows them that you're matching their teaching style which is the whole point of the interview any last words for the subscribers unsubscribe <laughs> shoot for the moon Aim for the stars. Cheers! Oh, that was good. That was good. My imposter syndrome is through the roof.